You're listening to Miss Style, Strength, and Grace with Deidre Murphy. This is your one-stop shop for style, fashion, health, and fitness. Deidre's passion is to help empower women to reach their fullest potential, both inside and out. Deidre and her guests will be discussing how to develop your style, health, and lifestyle hacks to energize your day and inspire you to keep reaching higher levels of success. Deidre is a professional fashion stylist, health guru, and Mrs. Washington 2017. It's time to get open and honest with Deidre. Hello and welcome, everyone. I am so excited to introduce my guest today. Her name is Maureen Francisco, and she is a former news anchor and reporter. She even covered stories for the local ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox affiliates, in addition to her brief time as a freelance reporter with Northwest Cable News in Seattle. She is the author of an award-winning book called It Takes Moxie, but she's best known for her role as the co-executive producer with her husband, David Van Maren, of Northwest Productions and Pageants Northwest. She oversees four state pageant qualifiers to Miss USA and Miss Teen USA in the Pacific Northwest. She is also the co-founder of the annual confidence building workshop, the Beauty Brand Believe Expo, and it features an awards show that celebrates all pageant systems. Maureen currently resides in the greater Seattle area with her husband and her three-year-old son, Malachi. So please enjoy my interview with Maureen Francisco today. Okay, well, I'm super excited to just dive in and start talking with Maureen Francisco. There's so many things that she can you know, share with us as an audience today. So Maureen, I am just really excited to have you on and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Deidre. Yeah, um, I wanted to first start, start talking about your time spent as a reporter. How did you get into working with the media? Let's hear a bit more about that. When I first came here to America, I was about maybe five years old. I could barely speak a word of English. So when I would come home after school, rather than watch cartoons, I would watch the local news. And I would practice saying the words out loud, the very same words the reporters or the news anchors would say. And I think that planted a seed in my mind that perhaps one day I wanted to go into television news. And it wasn't solidified until I did a pageant some, oh, a couple years ago. No, just joking. Some 20 years ago, I did this pageant. And I was so fascinated how this one reporter came to my house and was so interested in learning about my story. So I thought, wow, here she is getting paid to tell my story. Maybe I should be a journalist too. So when I went to college, I majored in broadcast print journalism, graduated from Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. After I graduated, I worked in Yakima, Washington, where I received my first on-air experience. From Yakima, I went to Savannah, Georgia, where I knew no one. And that really built character when you move to a new city with no friends and family. And then from there, went to Flint, Michigan, and eventually made my way back to Seattle, Washington, all in five years. The last station I worked at was at Northwest Cable News in Seattle. Wow, that's amazing. How This is a, not the next question that I originally planned, but how old were you when you did a pageant? And what pageant was it? I was 17 years old, and it was a Miss Teenage Scholarship pageant. And here's how small just the world is in general. I remember flipping through the program book the other day because um, when I was cleaning out our storage, I saw my program book that I competed in and I see Pamela Colonel. Oh my goodness. She had, yes, she had an ad in the program book and I texted her the picture. I go, Pamela, you have been so supportive of pageants because I did a pageant when I was 17 years old. So that's been more than 20 years ago. And our MC was a former Mrs. Washington America, Melissa. I don't know if you remember her. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, it was um, Melissa or Melinda, um, Melinda many, Reed? many years ago. Yes, that's her. Oh, yes. Yeah. And that was our that was our MC for our uh, pageant. So again, the oh, world goodness. is a lot smaller than we realize. 
Absolutely, especially the pageant family. So for my listeners, Pam Colonel, who she just mentioned, is actually my director as Mrs. Washington. And then like uh, like she just said, Melinda Reed was a former Mrs. Washington. And she's also a radio host of a program called It Seems to Me, which airs uh, locally here in Eastern Washington. So it is a really small world. <laughs> um, yes. I wanted to go back to your time as a reporter. What was your favorite memory or, or story that you featured while you were working as a reporter? So I love telling stories about people because you get such raw, authentic emotions coming out of people. And it's great to bring voice to whatever they're passionate about. Uh, the other stories that I enjoy doing or, or covering was medical procedures. So one of them was during sweeps month where if you're not familiar with television, there are certain months of the year where you try to get the ratings up because when you have high ratings, then the salespeople can sell a certain amount of ad time at a certain amount of dollars. Anyways, I was doing this live medical procedure on air, getting LASIK eye, sur LASIK eye surgery. So prior to getting LASIK eye surgery, my vision was probably a negative nine zero zero something. I mean, I was almost blind where when I would wake up in the morning, I couldn't find my glasses or I couldn't see the alarm clock. I would literally have to put my cell phone maybe a half an inch away from my face just to see the time. And this oh procedure goodness. was so life changing. Yes, it was so life changing. Here I was telling the viewers, I'm getting LASIK eye surgery. Right now, the doctor's cutting the cornea of my eye, trying to reshape so certain um, uh, light can come in and that will correct my vision. And if I sneeze, I seriously could have gone blind, okay? I mean, because here I am lying down yeah. and... They the literally have a laser. Cutting. Yes. And I it, it goes dark for a few seconds and that was a little bit scary because I wasn't expecting that. And when the procedure was done, I thought I was automatically going to get 20-20 vision. And when the procedure was done, it was still blurry. And I was thinking to myself, have I made a mistake? Oh, my gosh. You know, this did not correct my vision. But I was describing to the viewers, everything right now is still healing. My eyes are still healing. But I'm sure in a few days I will have 20-20 vision. And I was praying, oh, my goodness, please let me have 20-20 vision. So three days passed. Um, when I left that uh, facility, I had a gauze around um, my head because you want to really protect the eyes. You want them shut for a few days. When I finally was able to open my eyes again without the, the bandage, I was so shocked that I could see the top of a tree. It was so crystal clear. And I didn't realize that you can have vision like that. So to go back to your question, I love telling stories where I can also describe to the viewers what's happening in real time. So that was a really um, enjoyable time for me was walking, walking the viewers through certain um, live shots and particularly that one was very memorable for me. That's incredible. And that's an amazing experience to not only have, but what you said about being able to tell stories in real time, I think that's the amazing part of the world that we live in now is we really can share everything, you know, as it's happening with Facebook Live and Instagram Live, and we can really share a lot of unique stories when they're really happening. So that's really, I don't know, just... A fun little side note, I guess. <laughs> I really wanted to ask though next, you know, speaking of being a reporter and being in the media, obviously you're not necessarily in that world anymore, but how, what skills did you learn as a reporter that have carried over into, you know, running a business and being an entrepreneur? When I left reporting and anchoring, this was, um, gosh, I would say more than, 10, 15 years ago, what carried, what skills carried with me is the ability to network and really nurture your relationships. When you are a reporter, you are 
having relationships with people, whether it's the police department or the county or the city officials, because you want to get the scoop or you want to find out what's going on so you can tell the viewers, this is what's happening at city council today. And here's what it means to you. And this is how it's going to affect your lives. Now, um, those very same skills about nurturing your relationships as a business person, you have to nurture those relationships to this very day. For example, I feel like I'm Amazon, where when people email me a question, whether it's pageant related, whether it's award show related, whether it's reality show related, because our company does all of those things, I have to answer rather quickly. I often don't let emails go by no more than 24 hours. The only time I do that if it's a major holiday or I'm traveling or if there's a storm and I don't have internet. But you have to, again, just continue that relationship with people, whether it's email, whether it's face-to-face, -face, constantly nurturing that relationship because you want to make sure that whatever projects that you're doing and when your name is attached to it, that people have that confidence, that people know I know Maureen will take good care of me. I know she will answer all of my questions in a timely manner. So again, it's all about that relationship building, making sure what you say you deliver on, on those actionable items. You are very transparent. You're very professional. Uh, same thing with reporting and anchoring. You have to always be professional. There's no such thing as a private and a public life. They all mesh together. Mm -hmm. What happened in your private life becomes public and vice versa. So again, that transparency and being professional. It almost makes me sound or makes me feel like, you know, what you're saying is that you are your brand. And as you know, you represent your brand, whether it's via email or online, like you always want to make sure that you're staying consistent and realizing that things like you said, like what you do in your personal life does transfer over to how you're perceived as a professional. Yes. And, that's and when an you are skill to have, you know, no matter what. Exactly. And when I was a reporter, I had to report to thousands of people. Every time I reported the news, if I was inaccurate, there would be somebody calling in to the station saying that was incorrect. And thankfully, I did not receive many of those calls. I did a really good job of making sure I was very thorough. And as a business person, you report to a lot of people. Every time you post something on social media, that can be shared and viewed thousands and thousands of times. So your audience is in the masses. So you just always have to keep that in mind that you want to always be professional, transparent, and really um, provide that excellent customer care service. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good, uh, important lesson for not only you know women our age, but even younger girls, especially those that are coming into pageant world and everything like that, because they need to learn that everything they're posting on social media, like you just said, can be seen thousands of times over and they want to make sure that it's consistent with you know their values and their principles and their their, their personal brand and image. And that's such an important life it, lesson. Exactly. And what a lot of young people don't know is that employers will actually look through social media to see how is that person a brand ambassador for himself or herself. For example, I worked at a company and we were trying to decide whether we wanted to hire this particular person. But this person complained constantly on social media about everything, about life. It was a very victim mentality posting. And we were talking, management and myself, gosh, if we have is this person going to complain every single day at work? Because it's not fun to work with somebody who complains constantly. You want somebody yeah. who's upbeat, who's a team player, who's positive, because as you know, every day there are challenges that we face and you want to work with somebody who can get around those challenges rather than keep pouring salt on that wound. Yeah. So that's something I, I tell young people and actually anybody in general, just be really conscious of what you post because it's a reflection, as you said, Deidre, of your brand. Yeah. Well, that kind of leads me into this next question, you know, talking about 
tips that you would give to young people especially, but you know, as the director with Pageants Northwest, you work with numerous state title holders all throughout the Northwest, both teen and miss programs for the Miss USA system. What are the three biggest pieces of advice that you would give to any one, whether they're a teen, a miss, a missus, looking to get involved in, and succeed in pageantry? I know pageantry has done so many things for so many people. And the three reasons why people do compete in our pageant has to do with confidence. They want to be able to conquer anything that they want to do in life. Number two is they want to be able to speak better in public. And number three, they want to be pushed outside of their comfort zone. And my advice to anybody who wants to compete or a title holder is really know the responsibility of this title, whether it's at a local, a state, or a national level. You are a brand ambassador. And be really conscious. It's not about yourself. It's about being a voice for others. And number two, during the journey, whether you compete at the local or state or national level, there's going to be peaks and valleys. There are moments you're going to love your job, and there are moments you're like, what have I signed up to do? And just know the, the real reason why you're even doing this. Again, for many of the women, it's to build confidence, to work on their networking skills, to work on their public speaking skills. So I remind the young women, remind yourself why you're doing this journey because I guarantee it, you're going to have peaks and valleys where you're going to feel like you're on top of the world when it comes to competing. And then all of a sudden you're going to crash hard. You are going to start doubting yourself and fears start taking over, which then is um, manifests into excuses. So just be really conscious of that. And the other reason I tell, um, contestants and title holders understand that this is a journey this is beyond the crown some people are so hung up on winning the crown that if they don't win they feel like life is over and I've seen tantrums actually thrown and I want to tell them it's a journey it's all about building relationships as I mentioned to you earlier when I competed in my pageant my very first pageant and only pageant some 20 years ago here was um, Melinda, our MC, and I actually connected with her um, a few years ago, and I said, hey, we have some common friends, Pamela, um, and some other Mrs. Uh, title holders, that imagine if I was really angry at Melissa for not winning. I I'm sorry, Melinda for not winning, or if I threw a tantrum that weekend that I didn't win, and here she is just MCing the show. She had no results of the outcome. She would probably not respond to my emails. She's probably going to go, okay, that Maureen, I need to be really careful responding to her because I don't know what emotion she's going to throw um, at me. And here's something really interesting. The weekend that I competed in that pageant some 20 years ago, I'm really good friends with one of the judges. Day. I often work with her with our contestants on whether it's some modeling opportunity. So once again, you know, I was just very grateful about the experience. It's all about building relationships. And to think it's not just about that crown. It's really a journey about building relationships. And one more piece of advice that I have for people is learn to manage your emotions. Because I see everything. <laughs> I've seen people who, who if they don't make the semifinals, they threaten to walk out. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, since I didn't make the semifinals, why am I going to stay? Yeah. Why am like, I going to stay not for even the crowning the show. moment? Yes. Oh, and I tell people, you know what? Imagine, imagine the other contestants who sees this. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to go, wait a minute. Maybe I don't want to work with this person down the road. If this person doesn't win something, they're just going to be a really poor sport about it. So I just tell people, manage your emotions because like with any emotions, it's like a season. It too will pass. Yeah. And that's totally true. That speaks to me a lot because A, like I've developed a lot of relationships actually from some of the pageants that I didn't win. You know, one of the biggest relationships I've built is when I didn't win Miss Tri-Cities and now I actually volunteer with the Miss Tri-Cities program here locally. And, you know, if I would have been a a sore loser in the background, they wouldn't have wanted me to come back and volunteer with the system <laughs> years later. Um, and I think about this experience, actually it was the year that your husband 
I don't know if he's judged more than this particular year, but it was two years ago, your husband judged the Mrs. Washington pageant and I competed and actually I didn't win that year. I was uh, in the top 10, but I didn't win. And there's a picture of the, uh, the girl that won, the woman that won is Natalie Lutmer, who eventually became Mrs. America. So after that happened, I was like, bow down. Like, I don't even <laughs> feel bad at all for losing <laughs> to her. Anyway, there's a picture of her when her name was announced as the winner. And I'm right behind her in the shot. And I have a smile on my face. And I look back, like, so grateful and thankful for that. Because, like, how bad would that have been if that picture would have been circulating all around? And here I would have been in the background, like, with a nasty scowl or, you know, a, a dirty look on my face. Like, that wouldn't have been... <laughs> It's something I wanted circulating for years to come. So it's really important, like you said, and to it, like control your emotions. Yes, and it's all about timing. Look, the following year, it was your time. Mm -hmm. How yeah. wonderful was that? It's all about timing. And, and sometime you, sometimes you can do everything you can to prepare, and it just wasn't meant to be. It doesn't mean it's not going to be your time. Your time is going to come. And here you are such a wonderful representation of Washington. This is your time now, Deidre. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, you know, just to give a little bit of background, I first met Maureen when I became involved in the Miss USA, Miss Washington USA program. And I first met Maureen when I was there on the orientation day, handing in my paperwork, getting all my ducks in a row. And that leads me kind of to my next question. You know, how did you go from being in reporting and the media to then working with Pageants Northwest? Okay, full transparency, I married into it. <laughs> I did not. Like, I didn't my up for this. And said, yes, I have seriously married into it. So what happened was I met a pageant contestant. Uh, this was back in 2011. Uh, Tara is her name, Tara um, Richardson. And um, I think she changed it now because she's she's uh, married. Anyways, I think I may my have producer, competed with her at one point, but I, I can't be sure. But anyway, go ahead. Again, very small world. The pageant community, everybody knows um, each other. Anyways, um, when I was a reporter and anchor in Yakima, Washington, my producer um, married a teacher who was teaching this pageant contestant. So right. kind of like mentoring, training her. Yes, okay. exactly. Um, he was a high school teacher and, and she wanted to go into journalism. So he messages me on Facebook and said, would you mind taking her out to, uh, to coffee and just really walking her through what it takes to go into broadcast, um, to be a broadcast reporter. So I took her out for coffee and I told her, get an internship. It is so critical because oftentimes after your internship, you will make excellent connections and even possibly get a job at that station or a sister station. And then after I gave her some advice, she then asked me, well, you've been so kind sharing me everything that you have about getting into journalism. What can I help you with? And I told her, well, I'm working on this book about interviewing successful immigrants because a lot of people think you still can't achieve the American dream in this country. And I completely disagree. You still can. And she goes, well, since you're interviewing immigrants or people who come from humble beginnings, why don't you interview my state director? His name is David Van Maren. He was actually found by an American soldier somewhere between North and South Korea. And in the first five years of his life, he lived from one orphanage to another. And he was given a new name, a different birth date. And what people don't know is when you are transferred from one orphanage to another, there's a picture of you and you're holding a sign. And it has your name and, um, and a birth date that they think that you're um, Like a guesstimate of your birthday. So really, just this, yes. So to this day, we really don't know um, how old David is. So I was so amazed by just hearing a snapshot of his story. So I reached out to him. So I these said, were, I would love sorry to, to interrupt, were these orphanages in um, South Korea or were they orphanages here in the States? In South Korea. Okay. In South Korea. Um, and, and, and fast forward many years later, a loving family out of Oregon ended up adopting David. So he went from one extreme to another. He went from he can still vividly remember starving. Like that's a conversation we've had many times because um, we're so grateful every day when we 
wake up and we're like, gosh, we get to breathe, we get food, we have heat in our house, we have a roof over our head, so we can't be ungrateful. I mean, every day we are so blessed because, again, it's those stories that we're reminded just how how many blessings we have. Anyways, he went from one extreme, from humble beginnings to a family who adopted him in Oregon. And this family was very spiritual where they would not miss church. And they would even fly to go to church if this if it was really bad in terms of snow on the road. I mean, again, how many people do you know whose family flies a plane to go to church? So he went from one extreme to another. And... Um, and he didn't allow his past to dictate his future. I mean, David could have been really upset because he lived in an orphanage. He could have been upset that he was the only minority living in the entire county. So imagine your entire childhood, you move to the United States and you're the only minority. So he was bullied a lot. He faced a lot of um, racial division and, uh, he could have bottled it up, but instead what he did was he decided, you know what? I can either turn my life around or I can, I can head into this one direction and it's going to hit a dead end. It is not going to be a promising future. And David decided, you know what? I'm going to turn my life around. And he was blessed enough to get a phone call from the Trump organization, our, our now president, Donald Trump, um, asking him, hey, since you are in the entertainment business, at that time, David had his own sports talent management agency. Would you be interested in taking over Miss Washington USA, Miss Washington Team USA? And David said no initially because he knew nothing about pageants. But a young woman by the name of Jamie Kern Lima talked him into it. Jamie Kern Lima, to give you all some oh, background. She's is like the founder amazing. Of Cosmetics. <laughs> she is amazing. This is a woman who recently joined the L'Oreal family. She sold her company to uh, L'Oreal, and she is the first female president in L'Oreal's company history. This woman is a game changer, and David and her and all of us are still um, good friends to this day, and she's one of our proud sponsors of Pageants Northwest. Anyways, it was Jamie who told David, take on the role as state director, hire me as your producer, I'll be your MC, and I will teach you everything about pageants because Jamie loved pageants. So and at this point, David had she already been Mrs. Wa- or Miss Washington? At that point, had she already been the title yeah. holder? Yes, okay. she okay. was. Um, and then, yes, yes, so she, she had already um, served as Miss Washington USA. So how David even met Jamie Jamie was asked to be a judge of Miss Washington USA. And at that time when he was a judge, he had no idea scores were revealed. So David um, is a tough judge. I mean, in all honesty, he's a very tough judge. That's why I never ask him to critique something about me because I know he'll be honest. And let me give you an example. I decided, you know what, David, can you just critique my makeup, you know, because I thought he's going to say, Maureen, you look fabulous, right? This is when I first met him. And he goes, the, the advice he gave me, he goes, Maureen, don't pluck your brows anymore. Oh, my goodness. And I go, oh, I wasn't, <laughs> I really wasn't expecting that answer. I was expecting, oh, you're great. You're beautiful. You're perfect. Yeah. You know, I wanted to be flattered, right? But he gave me that advice, don't pluck your brows anymore because your brows won't grow, you know, if you keep over plucking them. Mm -hmm. And am I thankful for that advice? Yes, I'm very thankful for that advice, but I wasn't expecting it. Um, And David is such an honest person that be prepared. If you ask him for advice, whether you're his wife or a contestant or anyone, he will give you full transparency. So um, back to the story of how I got involved in um, Pageants Northwest. Uh, um, I meet David um, because I'm interviewing him to f- for my book. And then I would say almost a year later, I email him to say, hey, great news, my book finally is getting published. And I want to say thank you for taking your time out of your busy day to be a part of it. So 
Um, we met at an event that I was producing. I was uh, the president of Ascend, which is a nonprofit about empowering young people. I invited him to this event, and what he didn't know was I was sifting through pictures, and he looked so bored. He looked painfully bored at this event that I felt so bad that I decided, hey, David, let me make it up to you. Let me take you out to dinner. So we went out to dinner March, 23, uh, March 23, 2012. I still remember it to this day. And we just had a great conversation. And I was thinking, I want this guy to be my mentor. Mm -hmm. I want this guy to read all my contracts because that is his background. He was um, an agent. And, uh, and we just became great friends after that. And I, I didn't know that um, David was actually interested in me more than a friend. Um, I mean, when you meet David, he's so like unique. You can't tell if he's flirting. In fact, I have to actually email him and ask him, are you flirting with me? Because I couldn't tell. Um, oh, that's that he finally told me like, hey, bro. <laughs> yeah, he was like, oh, you couldn't tell? I, I said, yeah, I, to be honest with you, I could not tell if you were not because I didn't know whether you're flirting or you're, or, or, or are you my mentor. And he was like, um, he didn't actually answer that question. He was very roundabout. What he said was, Maureen, I told God the next person who I date is who I'm going to marry. That's why I'm being so careful with you because you are a woman going to do amazing things in this world. And I just want to make sure that the next woman I is who I'm going to marry. And um, a week or two later, that's when David, you know, told me, you know what, Maureen, I was right when I do on March 20th. That's when he knew he wanted to marry me. He then really confirmed that almost a month later said, yeah, I actually definitely do want to marry you. So it was a very Aww. quick courtship. That's what I thought because yeah, you guys um, got married pretty that. quickly after that, correct? Yeah, it was. David's a type of person, if he knows something, why wait? Bam. So what do you know, you know, a, right? Months, uh, later. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and here I am now involved with uh, the pageant. So I was actually working at another company, at a startup company called realself.com. It's the number one website in the world when it comes to aesthetic procedures. And I get a call several months later after we've been married and David said, hey, Maureen, so I was just asked to take on the Montana um, pageant. And at that time, David was overseeing Washington and Idaho. And then he asked me, I can't do this by myself. Either we hire somebody just like you or you take that leap of faith and do this with me. So I took that leap of faith and here we are working together ever since. Oh, that's amazing. And that's a you know, huge testimony, not only to your faith, but also to your marriage. Um, I tried working physically in the office with my husband in our, our wellness clinic for a period of time and it just didn't work out well for us. Like I was like, I love you, babe, but... I, I'm going to kill you if I have to work with you physically one more day. <laughs> so like, power it, to you guys as tough. a couple. I know, it I is tough. Like what no, piece of advice you know, would you give to a woman or any women that have to work with their spouses? Like what, what's the thing that makes it work for you guys? What works for us is that we have excellent communication skills. Hmm. And it's one of those things where we see each other every single day. So there is a desk. David works on one side of the desk. I work on the other side. That is how close we are. We don't even have separate offices. We're working and sharing the same desk, okay? And it's one of those things is if you have a disagreement, you need to really walk through it and talk through it before you go to bed that night because otherwise you don't want it to carry in the bedroom, right? You don't want to hold grudges or anything. And it's one of those things David and I can really talk freely about each other. And when we do talk freely, we our intentions are good. We're not there to hurt the other person. We're, we're speaking very openly and honestly. But again, I don't recommend it for everyone to work with their spouses. I mean, when I talk to my girlfriends who do not work with their spouses, they have amazing date nights where they can talk about work. Um, because it's fresh to the other person's spouse's ear. Yeah. When we have date nights, 
I tell David, gosh, this sounds like a business meeting. <laughs> like, can we write this off? <laughs> we talked yes. about this tonight, right? Yeah. See you in meetings. Because it, yes, because it's so hard to turn it off. I mean, yeah. you almost have to like turn that yeah. off, like have a switch yeah. of like, okay, tonight is like no business talk. Let's just talk about family or the holidays or your son or, or whatever it is. Almost yes, up. and we did try that. I asked him one day during our date night, so tell me, what did you do today? And he goes, well, I worked right in front of you all day. <laughs> so, so we did try it, but yeah. it ended up sounding more kind of like circling work, back to the same. <laughs> oh, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's power to you guys. I mean, Chris and I do kind of work together on stuff. Like, he's definitely a, a helper to me. He's kind of my tech guru. So, like, when I finish podcasts or whatever, I just send him the audio, and he is the one that, like, uploads it to iTunes and does all the, the technical stuff for me. So, in a sense, Chris and I do work together, but not as closely as, as you and David. So, that's, <laughs> that's inspiring. Um, I did want to go back and talk about your book for a little bit. So, like I said in the intro, you wrote, It Takes Moxie, and it's all about you know how to make it in America, especially as the children of immigrants. So what, in that book, like what is it, and not only that, it was the multicultural nonfiction winner for the 2013 National Indie Excellence Awards. What is some of the biggest takeaways that that book provides to your readers? Some of the biggest takeaways are everyone has 24 hours in a day. And I think people forget that whether you're rich or poor, tall or short, male or female, each of us has 24 hours in a day. And it's what we do and fill that time with that really makes a difference. Yeah. yeah like even Einstein takeaway, had 24 hours in yes. a day. <laughs> Yes, and, and I think people forget that because people will look at somebody and they'll go, well, they got a better leg in life in terms of maybe resources or family or this or that. And I tell them, you know what? It's all about what you do and those precious time that you do have. I have seen people who have filled their time playing video games all day. And I'm not saying video games are bad or anything, but I also see people like Jamie Kern who work on their business, her and her husband work on the business constantly, and that's why it's so successful and it's a household name today. So again, it's all about what you do with that time. The other takeaway is don't let your past define your future. Again, the people I interviewed are all immigrants or come from very humble beginnings where they had maybe just a few dollars in their pocket to really survive in America, but they didn't keep picking at their past and stay like being put the at difference that one between spot. like being a victim versus a victor. I don't know if you're a Joel Osteen exactly, fan at yeah. all, but he always sa says that like being a victor, not a victim, and I think that's such a huge mental shift that, you know, does define you as an individual. Yes. And, and I know people who still are defined about some childhood issues and, uh, and it's okay to work on those childhood issues. Like for example, what David, I mean, David, again, being the only minority in his entire county, he really had to work on, um, some of those childhood issues. Me coming to this new country and I couldn't speak a word of English. That was really tough because I was also picked on, but I didn't let those circumstances tell me that's going to be my future. I allowed those circumstances to actually motivate me. I didn't like feeling not accepted by my peers because I couldn't speak to them in English. So rather than go home and watch cartoons, I told myself, you know what, I'm going to watch cartoons. I'm going to learn how to speak English so I can finally talk to my classmates. It's kind of having that mentality. So that's another takeaway. And there's so many others. Oh, yeah. Um, so people should definitely go and buy your book yes. so they can get all of the the takeaways. Um, you, you know, you talked about, like, we all have 24 hours in a day. Actually, that was one of my questions is, you know, what are some of the tips or ways that you are able to kind of get more out of the day but still maintain balance? 
Yes. Well, first thing, there's no such thing as balance in my life. Zero balance. And everybody tells me, Maureen, you need more balance. But frankly, it doesn't exist. It never existed in my life. For example, I actually went to bed at 3 a.m. this morning. And the reason why I went to bed at 3 a.m. Because, because everybody was asleep and I was thinking, nobody's going to call me. I won't get as many emails. And I can get so much stuff done from... 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. I will have uninterrupted uh, time to really catch up on the day. And it was great. Um, I still woke up, you know, at my normal time. My normal time can be anywhere from 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. just depending on whether I go to bed at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. the next day. So again, it's all about um, setting your priorities. Before I actually attack my day. I already have my to-do list that I created previously. So I'm not left going, okay, what am I going to do today? I know exactly what I'm doing to the Um, While I know exactly what I'm doing to the T, also I'm flexible, meaning stuff happens. Like if my son gets sick, um, I've got to, I've got to, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, the take mom. Take care of your kid. With, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so you have to have that flexibility, but no, there's no such thing as balance, zero balance, especially if you're an entrepreneur. It's not like you can clock in at 9 a.m. and leave 5 p.m. You are you feel like Amazon, where with Amazon, you want to order something, you want something the next day or the day after, right? Like you want it immediately. So We all want that um, two-day prime. That, <laughs> the two -day exactly, <laughs> and, I, and I have that. I have that prime time Amazon mentality ingrained in my head. Um, the other piece of advice is just give yourself grace because there are some days I feel like, man, you know, I really wanted to do this and accomplish this and I didn't get this done and now I feel really overwhelmed. And then I have to tell myself, Maureen, you did the very best that you could and you were still able to accomplish a lot. And, and for any person to see what I did that day, they would be like, ah, that's a lot. But to me, I feel like I can even do more and I can even maximize more. So I'm learning to give myself grace to tell myself it's okay. It's okay that you watch a movie without the computer in front of you. You know, like little things like that. Like I'm probably one of the very few people who actually watches a, a movie and I have my computer in front of me like responding to emails. It's stuff. terrible. Yeah. Yes, yes. So um, again, it's there's no balance in giving yourself grace. Oh, I love that. And then um, kind of making sure that you get the big rocks in, you know what I mean? Like putting in the big yes. tasks that you have to get that done that day. And if there's little stuff that doesn't happen, it's okay. Like the the laundry basket that didn't get folded, it's going to be okay. <laughs> yes. And I'm so blessed because I have actually have not had to do laundry that much because my husband is such a clean freak. So he does laundry every day, oh, wow. every single day. Oh, yes. Even before I am done working out, he's like, okay, time to take your um, sweaty clothes and wash it. I'm like, like oh, strip off that I'm sweatshirt. I'll throw it in the washer for you right now. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, he is such a, a clean freak. So, uh, so I've, I've been blessed about not having to do the laundry. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> so before we kind of get towards the end of our, our interview today, I did want to hear a little bit more about your story. You know, like what brought you to the United States and, you know, how were you so driven to, you know, come home and watch the news and learn English rather than just plop on the couch and watch cartoons or something like, tell me a little bit about your story. What brought you to the States? Yes, so with many immigrants, we come to this country for better opportunities. I grew up in a house where I shared with 15 family members, and we had one bathroom. Mm. And this was a tiny house, okay? Your living room was your bedroom. Oh you goodness. slept where you could find um, a spot. And honestly, I never felt that I came from humble beginnings. Never felt it until I came here to this country and realized, whoa, a house normally has just one household, not multiple households. And most houses have more than one bathroom, not one bathroom to share with 15 family members. And when I realized the opportunities in this country, just with my new living environment, I decided I don't want to go back 
I don't want to go back to the humble beginnings, even though, again, I never felt like it was humble beginnings. I received a lot of love for my family, but I learned to like nice things in life. When you introduce me to nice things, I'm going to really love them. And it's backwards. I think that was it. That was the moment that really changed my life going, I got to work hard if I want to achieve these crazy big dreams I, I have to work hard because, again, when you come from humble beginnings, you only have up to go to in life. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic to hear. And it makes me feel a little bit bad for hating the fact that when we, my husband and I were first married, we lived in a 1940s home and we only had one bathroom. And I thought that was bad sharing it with him. I'm like, oh, there's, <laughs> there's man hair in my sink. <laughs> you just learn, like, you know, to appreciate it. Now, I do have days when I complain and I, and then I learn to stop myself going, wait a minute, Maureen, like check yourself. Whoa, exactly. Yeah. For example, um, when I was sweeping our house, uh, and I was complaining going, gosh, you know, I'm constantly cleaning and like, I just feel like it never stops. But then I learned to shift my mind going, Hey, at least I have a house to clean. Okay. Mm -hmm. So be appreciative of that. So when I find myself going in one direction, I, you can switch your mind very quickly and go, at least you have this, you know, yeah. and uh, it's been a really great way to change my, my mind frame. And, and when you do that, you just feel better about your day. Yeah. Like having some, being thankful even for the bad is like what I, I like to call it. Like thankful for the bad. Yes. Like even the other night, um, yes. I, I told my husband that I was thankful for some things that he never would have thought I would have said thank you for because he's kind of like your husband, David. Um, my husband, Chris, is very much a neat freak, like minimalism. If you don't need it, get rid of it right now. Like I bought him a new shirt for Christmas and he's like, okay, which shirt do I need to get rid of now? And I'm like, just because I buy you one new shirt doesn't mean you have to get rid of like one older ones, especially when he only has like, you know a closet with only like five or six shirts, but he's just very like streamlined about his getting dressed process. It's just funny being married to a personal stylist over here. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, I told him, I was like, you know what, babe, I'm actually really thankful that you force me to purge every now and then, you know, whether it's like in the house or closet or just tidying up because I could easily be that hoarder. Like I come from a family where it wasn't like TLC, like hoarding TV show bad, but like, <laughs> It was, yeah, like humble beginnings and, and we just like held on to a lot of stuff. Um, but anyway, I could easily go that route. And so like he forces me to streamline things and, and purge and, and get rid of stuff. And he, he was like, wow, I'm surprised you're saying thank you for that. I'm like, you know, you got to be thankful for the stuff that you don't even realize you need to appreciate. So I'm actually pretty extreme where I don't even like things on the walls. Like if you look at this room, we only have the television, but we only have one picture up in our entire house. I'm trying to show it to you yeah. through uh, Skype, but we only have one picture up on our entire house. Our wedding pictures aren't even up on the walls yet. Oh. It, it, it's one of those things. I don't like anything on the walls. You know, it's, like a, it's a weird and thing. Knickknacks. And, yeah. Yeah. That's, he's actually People the come same to our way. house and they're like, did you just move in? Well, I don't know. Oh, yes. No, when people come into our house, they're like, "There's it's so white. There's nothing on your walls. I go, yeah, I, I like the minimalist look. Like, I seriously, yeah, just don't like things on the walls. Yeah, well, there's less to dust and clean, yes. so there's there's benefits yeah, exactly. to it. exactly. Yeah. For sure. No, I yes. was the same way. Like, he doesn't even like the fact that I leave the blender on the counter. He's like, can't we just, like, tuck that into the counter? And I'm thinking, <laughs> I use it every single day. Like, if you know me, I drink a green smoothie, protein smoothie, every <laughs> single morning. I'm like, I'm not going to get it out and in every single morning. He's like, okay, but just the blender stays on the counter in the kitchen. I'm like, all right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this is funny, like opposites, right? Uh, anyway, but I, there's a few questions here that I always want to ask, you know, to help inspire my listeners. And first of all, I noticed on your website that you put on there that you're a marathon one, runner. So I wanted to just briefly talk about that. Um, how many have you done? And what has being able to run a marathon taught you in life? I've done two full marathons and two half marathons. 
And it taught me, again, everything is a season because every time I would sign up for a marathon, I'd be so excited. And during the journey, I would ask myself, why am I doing this? This is so painful. <laughs> and I still have how many more miles to go? Oh, goodness. I It happens every single time. And, uh, and again, I just remind myself it's a season. And if you have something challenging, um, it was, it's going to pass just like the marathon. It's going to be over soon and just actually enjoy the process. And the reason why I started to do marathons is I wanted to see if I could actually do it. When I first heard about how many miles, that's like more than 23 miles. Really? There's no way I could do that. And then I was like, okay, well, let me just see if I could. And when I actually completed the marathon, it reminded me once again, you can really do anything you set your mind to. And I remember I was hobbling across that finish line. Yeah. I was in so much pain, but it felt wonderful to do it. And what was even more motivating was when a grandmother passed me. Oh. When I saw this grandma <laughs> passing me, you're like, oh, eight years old. Yes, I was oh like, there's goodness. no way that grandma's going to pass me. And then when I saw a gentleman running with no shoes, I go, okay, there's no way I'm going to have this guy with no shoes pass me. So like, those are time things to kick it up a that motivate me. <laughs> exactly. I love that. And that's really great for me to hear because I just signed up for my very first half marathon and it'll be in April. So that's my goal this year. I was like thinking about it because I made some physical fitness goals to prep for Mrs. America. And then when that ended and I hit those goals, I'm like, okay, like what's next? And I was like, well, why don't I do a marathon? I've never, I'm not a runner by nature. I actually hate running. So for me to like sign up for a run, I'm like, wow, this is, this is a big deal. So I appreciate those words of advice. Um, what advice would you give to someone looking to complete a physical fitness goal or just somebody not necessarily doing a, a marathon, but just looking to stay more active? You need to just do it. It's that simple. If you want to be the best you, you just got to do it. Uh, there has been times where I haven't hit the gym. Like the longest time I think I did not hit the gym was a week or two. Um, I would say before kids, because I was very consistent about hitting the gym. And now the longest after kids, it's been a month. And I told myself, you know what? It's not going to get easier. Mm -hmm. I need to somehow find time. And the older we get, things don't work as the same way that we used to remember things working. So um, you just got to really take care of your body. I still struggle going to the gym. I struggle because, again, you or an entrepreneur, there's a lot of things on your plate, and then you have um, a child to take care of. But then I remember reading something about the president working out, and I'm thinking, gosh, if the president can find time to work out, I can certainly make time to work out. And that, once again, changed my mind frame. Yeah, and again, it goes back to what you said about putting things into your schedule and making a big rock or a big to-do list. And I'm kind of the same way. Like I first get up and I, I work out like it is my big rock. I don't schedule morning meetings like first thing in the morning because I'm like, nope, I work out until this time to this time. And then I can have free time after that to, to have an interview or, or whatever it is. So that is awesome to hear that from other people too. <laughs> yeah. And, and we have to be reminded that it's the only thing we have. I mean, it's a temple. We got to really take care of it because if you don't take care of it, who else will take care of it for you? Yeah. Nobody can do that, that mile for you. And I think too, the biggest thing is that sometimes women especially get intimidated by working out and they think like, Oh, I, if I'm going to do it, I have to work out for hours on end or I have to, you know, mm -hmm. go with all the meatheads at the gym. And it's not that it's like, you can get in some exercise, whether it's just like a 15 minute little, hit exercise in your home or a walk or taking the kids out for, you know, a, a visit to the park, like doing something active, something's better than nothing. So that, that's the way that yes, I try to inspire exactly. other women to get active is just like do something, you know, and, and make it fun for your, you and your kids or make it fun for you and find something that you can find fun. So that way you stick with it longer. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, well, there's a few questions here that I kind of typically ask any of my guests on the show. So we'll just kind of 
wrap up with these few questions and then we'll talk about some ways that people can find you and get in touch with you. But I would love to know if you have a positive quote or affirmation that you just love. Yes. So when I married David, I remember one of his vows, he said something about every breath is a miracle. And that has kept me so grounded. Whatever challenges or whatever um, obstacles that I face or whether the high moments in life, I always remind myself that every breath is a miracle. We're alive. Let's enjoy it. Let's make the most of it because we don't know when that next breath might end. So that's been a big, yes, that's been a really big positive um, motivating quote for me. That's great. As far as other resources, I mean, obviously your book is a great resource, but do you have any other favorite resources that you've just been like binging on lately, whether it's a book, a podcast, you know, uh, any sort of, you know, I guess resource that you have that you've just been loving? For pageants, I would recommend um, people to listen to Win a Pageant with Alicia Darby. Are you familiar with that, Deidre? It's a, it's the number one podcast on iTunes. And I just recently met Alicia um, less than a year ago. And if people don't have the resources to hire a coach, she will walk you through step by step. Just listen to her podcast because she um, interviews a lot of amazing people like yourself and uh, she's been doing it now for a couple of years so when it comes to competing in the pageant she's a great resource when it comes to life the bible I actually just started opening up my bible and started reading it um, is because I figure you know what if I'm going to say that I have faith and I believe in God I better understand everything or and I know you can't understand everything, but at least I should try to make that attempt to understand more about my faith and about um, my um, my spiritual journey. So I actually just started um, reading the Bible again, and it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely hard to decipher. I will actually Google some like, things after I read. What does this translation like, mean? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Thank I goodness will, for nice. you know, like different Google translations, it. like everything from New American Standard yes. to New King James. Like, thank goodness for different interpretations. And there's even apps. Like, if you feel like you don't have time to read the Bible, there's apps that you can have it on their phone and to to like lead you through how to read the Bible in a year. Or let's say you want to stretch it out to like a year and a half to two years, it'll tell you like how much to read per day. Like, there's so many ways to to help that with like our our technology nowadays. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I'll be reading, um, scripture and I'm like, whose son is that? And who, who was the mom? And I was like, Oh yeah, it's so hard to read. I mean, like, I'm like, I'll I'll sometimes we'll look through the pages and and all it will be are who are the descendants. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, these are, am I supposed to memorize all of these names? Because there's no way that I can. Right, so I'll like, like flip. So and so begot so and so. And yeah. <laughs> yes. I love yes. It. So that for spiritually, what else do I enjoy um, following? I really love Oprah. I, I do. I love uh, following her on social media. I've been a huge fan of Oprah. I went to one of her shows when she had her talk show in Chicago and I just remember sitting in the audience and just feeling the electricity when she walked into the room. There are some people who radiate electricity and she's one of them. And I remember bawling. I remember Aww. sitting in the audience and I was just like, crying because all that excitement I was so emotional. And energy. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes. Cause I just, I'm like, it's Oprah. I didn't get a chance to speak to her, but just being in, a room with her and I remember being moved up closer to the stage because here's the trick if you ever want to go and watch a talk show if you are dressed in a very colorful color uh, producers will tend to move you up because it looks better for camera purposes and that day I believe I was wearing um 
a yellow dress and you definitely could not miss me. So I had an opportunity to sit closer to the stage and I just remember being in awe with her. So I enjoy following her. I enjoy um, reading about the White House doctor. So the woman who wrote the foreword of my book, she is the former White House doctor to three U.S. presidents. That's President Clinton, President Bush Jr., President Bush Sr. And her book, The White House Doctor, talks about what happens when you are breaking the bamboo ceiling. Bamboo ceiling is a term for Asians when you're capped at a certain place. Um, or what happens when you're breaking the glass ceiling, and that's for just people in general. Yes, and here she is, this petite woman about five feet one and here she was a doctor to these um, presidents and when there was an emergency at the White House people would go to her and say we don't want the nurse we want the doctor and she would tell them I am the doctor I'm not the nurse I'm actually the doctor and she faced so much discrimination but she didn't let that bother her and I asked her what did you do during those moments because oftentimes People thought you were the nurse and not the doctor. And she said, I would just show them what excellence would look like. And perhaps that would shift their mind, what their idea of what excellence had previously looked like to now accept that excellence can also look like me. Mm -hmm. So that's another great book. That's awesome. I love that. Well, I have two more questions for you and then we are about to wrap up. So Number one, or the first of my second, two questions, wow, <laughs> is what are your top yes. three core values? My top three core values. I actually heard this while I was at a funeral. It really hit me. I was listening at my friend's um, dad who had passed away, and it was a gentleman who said, you know what, you have a good life if you have accomplished this, these three things. And I'm going to take those three values to my heart. Number one is if you have faith. If you know what your faith is, you're never going to be lost. Number two is if you find your purpose. Every day when you wake up, once again, you're not going to feel lost. And number three, when you find your life partner. It is so critical in choosing the right partner for life because that will actually not only shape the trajectory of your life, but if you were to have children, future generations. So I consider myself having a very blessed life just for those three things that I've been able to, to accomplish, finding mm -hmm. faith, having purpose, and finding my life partner. Yeah. Oh. I love that. Especially, I, I feel like mine are actually the same, just a little different wording. I always say like God, family, and um, like friends. So like, you know, just, and having that purpose too, I think is encompassed in that. So that really resonates with me too. And then my last question is something I always ask my, my guests on the show. What does it mean to do things with style and grace? What does it mean to do things with style and grace? It's when you don't get your way. Ooh. You're able to show people what character looks like. And I'm using that example because, as you know, I run four state pageants. Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington. These are the state pageant qualifiers to Miss USA and Miss Teen USA, you have the most accomplished, most beautiful, most driven women. And there are defining moments when people don't hear their name called. When they don't hear their name called, they either will react in a very negative way or they will react very happily for somebody else. They're gonna be like, you know what? I'm so happy for that person. So I tell people, when you don't get your way, you are going to actually show people what character looks like. Because it takes great, great character to win, and it also takes great character not to win. And also in my life, I don't always get everything that I set my heart you know, to do. And sometimes I just have to trust in my faith, like, okay, God, this is not what you want 
for me right now, but I'm going to trust you. For example, I didn't meet my husband until in my 30s, and David didn't meet me until he was 45 years old, okay? Never been married, no children, and had complete faith in God, saying, God, I know you're going to send me the right woman. And he was very patient to wait for me at 45 years old. How many people do you know at 45, never been married, no kids? And um, the very first um, woman he introduces to his family is, is going to be his wife, and that was me. He never brought anybody home um, to his family until he knew the right person he was going to bring. So um, that's incredible. Like, like it, it goes back yeah. to that, like when you know, you know, and and he knew that God had a bigger purpose and goal and plan for him. That's amazing. Yes, I love that. Yes. Well, how can my listeners find you, and what are the different resources that you have? I'd love to to have you share those of how people can find you, whether it's social media, websites, all that. So my website is marinefrancisco.com. You can also find me on the globalbeautyawards.com. That is an event that we're producing on March the 10th. It is recognizing all pageant systems. We're celebrating current and past title holders as well as those who serve the pageant community. As you know, Deidre, there's a lot of volunteers, a lot of choreographers, producers, directors, you name it. That's another site you can find me and also on social media, whether it's Facebook Marine Francisco or Instagram at Marine M Francisco. Um, you can find all of my social media handles on my website, which is once again, MarineFrancisco.com. Love it. And then your book is It Takes Moxie. Correct. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast today. And I just look forward to seeing you probably in, in March when I'll be at the Beauty Brand Believe Expo. So thank you again for joining. Thank you so much for this. And this fill, fills me up. So I hope Aww. that your listeners are able to walk away with something. But, you know, just talking and really getting to know you. Again, thank you so much. And I just uh, I can't wait to see you in March. Hey, ladies, thanks for listening. And we hope you enjoyed today's episode. To help empower more women, please be a doll and rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes and other free resources we mentioned today, go to stylebydeidra.com.